the piece was written in uh, 1941, 1941, was it? 40, yes. 1941. And I think Messiaen had become, he was 32 years old when he was captured by the um, Nazis and put into the uh, war ca a prison of war camp in Germany. It's actually in a, a place which is now in Poland, I think. Yeah. But, um, yes. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, so there's a huge religious aspect to the piece. Each of the movements is um, very clearly, there's a poem attached to each movement. And, and uh, there are two movements which are about Jesus. Uh, the, the first one is the um, solo cello movement, which is um, number four, I think. And that's about the, the word Jesus and, and then the, about the actual word being incredibly long and standing the test of time as being an incredibly beautiful word by itself, just the word. And then it comes back and it's the violin has a that's the last the solo, last right? One. And that, that explores more of the kind of the religious meaning of Jesus, isn't it? Yeah. I think. So uh, anyway, and the other movements are, are all... Um, religious in nature as well, and uh, so you can read about that in the um, in the program notes, I'm sure. And then, as I said, for me, I'm fascinated with the idea. He had sketches with him, and it was a prison guard who then encouraged him or enabled him to um, to to write. He gave him paper, he gave him pencil, <coughs> uh, you know, help provide instruments and and so on and so forth. And I I find it amazing. Um, I mean, it's just a lesson in life how one very, very small factor, one way or the other, can make the difference between a masterpiece being created and, and not being created. And I do want to stress, because I, I think this is a part of art in general that, that we need to um, think about, that often in very difficult times, a lot of great art is created. And, um, and, I, and I, I think that's an important message. And I think, you know, this is probably one of the worst things that could happen to someone is going to a Nazi concentration camp. And, and this great um, piece that we're enjoying on the other side of the world, you know, uh, decades and decades later on, w was a uh, r result of this. If you, you know, if you try to read as much as possible, if the audience will try to read as much as possible about, about the music, trying to understand where it came from and uh, why it was written and I think that is the first step, you know, to listening to any kind of music. Actually, it doesn't really. It's not just modern music, but that really helps, I think. And since we have a huge story and a lot of knowledge about where this music came from and about Messiaen and about the uh, the time period and you know the Second World War and prisoner of war camps and the fact that it was written for a piano that only had a few few notes that didn't work, right? Yeah, and yeah. Yeah. and uh, is that the true of the clarinet as well? Is it? Well, you know, I, I've been reading a little about the piece, and, and they say that Messiaen's account is, it differs from even the musicians and the people that were there, that he, people feel he, he was exaggerating uh, the conditions, and, and, and it's difficult to, to pinpoint exactly. Yeah. But in his mind, it, the audience was going crazy, and it was in the most difficult possible uh, conditions. Um, but I, I do want to say, I mean, people should be open-minded, because all famous war horses, Mozart, Beethoven, whatever, it was contemporary music at one, one time. And, and when you listen to contemporary music, you don't know. You might be listening to the piece that in 200 years will be you know, considered Beethoven. But the Messiaen, I, I, I think the answers we've been given are, is, is only, that we've been giving is only one dimensional. We're talking about contemporary music, new music. Make no mistake, this is a war horse. This is you know, part of the standard repertoire um, you know, it, it, it's as recorded as, as I think many of the famous classical pieces of, you know, many of the well-known musicians have performed this time and time again. I, I think it, it's something that isn't performed much in Hong Kong. People should come in and just experience that. And, uh, and you know, but do realize this has stood a, a miniature test of time already. And, and I expect it to, to stand a further test of time. This is a special piece. The first time I ever heard the piece was at midnight in a church in Manhattan. It's a, it's a mood setter, you know. It's a mood setter. You sit there uh, absorbing. Um, it's, it's a very moving situation, and it, and it sets the mood uh, 
not in a very straightforward way. Um, so I think that there's different levels that you can get something out of it. Um, I mean, to me, I'm, I'm inspired by the story, how it was uh, done in a prisoner of war camp, and the instrumentation, which is very unusual, uh, based on the fact that these were the only musicians that were in the camp. But what inspired me, or not, or interests me, is that there was actually a prison guard who helped enable this piece to be composed. So he actually provided paper and pencils. He helped provide uh, permission to put on the concert. He helped to provide instruments. And after the war ended, he actually wanted to look up Messiaen, and um, and he refused to see him. Um, I thought that was that was fascinating. I, mean, I can only imagine the kind of emotions that are intertwined in, in, and how complex they are in that entire situation. So I, I think um, you'd be silly not to cheat yourself of the opportunity to hear this piece. Yeah. The, first, the first time I performed this piece was about 25 years ago, in a, and it was in a tiny uh, Greek island in the middle of nowhere, and just for olive farmers. And they had been turning their noses up at Haydn and Beethoven, mm. and then we performed this in a, in a church school, the schoolhouse actually, uh, by candlelight, and they went absolutely crazy for it. They, it was, that was the best thing that we did the whole time, you know, it was a huge hit, I think because it's just so incredibly engaging, the music, you know. So it's a very special piece, really. It's a similar experience, I think, mm. the church. Mm. Well, Messiaen even documents in the camp the different levels of education, experience, uh, diversity of background, and also how uniformly <coughs> people were affected. Uh, so I, I think it's a it's very interesting uh, phenomenon. I think this piece, what's interesting about this piece is that Messiaen being, we, we know him as a very mathematical composer. Mm -hmm. You know, you know uh, he, he, he's not your, t uh, your typical Brahms or something that's, you know, it's, it's the, the music that he creates, it's based on certain thoughts that he has or certain experiences that he lived. And... Uh, um, but what, what's interesting is, is that when you hear this piece, uh, he, he somehow is able to create a mood, an atmosphere, an atmospherical mood that everybody can relate to. And uh, all seven movements of this piece, I think they all each have their own character. And, and they're all very just opposite and different. And... Uh, you just have to sit there and listen, and you, you already you probably would guess the name of each t uh, the title of each movement because mm -hmm. they're just very very it's 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 very atmospherical you know yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but I, I was talking about that performance that I gave in Greece and that um, somebody thought it was a good idea to have the ch the children from the school draw pictures on the board mm -hmm. on the blackboard in coloured chalk. And I remember this incredible picture of the angel of death coming down from the fiery clouds and the, with the trumpets pointed, poking out of these fiery clouds. And it was just kind of magical. It was one of the best concerts I've ever, ever given because it was such a weird um, program to put on in, in a, such a tiny little island, you know. But uh, it really is, like you say, it's so programmatic, the music, incredibly obvious. When you have a look, when you have a little bit of understanding of of, uh, of the movements and what they mean, then it's very easy to fit that in with the, what you're hearing, you know. And, and simply put, I think, well, for the whole 100 years, the 20th century, I mean, this could, I mean, you might disagree, but this might be the piece, the the, the chamber music piece that is so important in in the history of classical music in in, in mankind, actually. Um, because of the context, so it's not played enough, I think. So yeah. we are very fortunate to be bringing that to you. Yeah, I, I actually, I, Warren addressed the question in terms of its context. Um, I would, I don't think of it in terms of con I, I think of, let's say, Beethoven's string quartet that actually moves uh, forward. Uh, it actually moves sort of from classical via romantic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This piece I, I set aside. I, I, I don't think it has a context. I, it has a context within Messiaen's own compositions. His introduction of uh, he started to use birds and bird calls more and more after this, and and he started to to uh, uh, put put the idea of birds and and bird calls and whistles and so forth in this music. 
But I think this, this piece just stands on its own in a way. I, I, I wouldn't put it in the context. I think for many, many reasons, it just sort of stands on its own as an experience, you know, rather than, than a, a contextual piece within uh, 20th century. Uh, Unlike Richard, Richard has played the piece before, and maybe Andy has too. A little bit. Okay. And for me, it's actually my first performance of this piece. And I can say from just by looking at the music and, you know, doing, doing your work, that it's not a piece that's, that, that can be put up in a couple amount of rehearsal and a concert. It's this kind of project that you have to give yourself a timeline and say, okay, okay, at this point I, I, I need to do this and this. And it takes really a lot of time and assimilation to, of, of the music itself to really get into your system to be able to play this concert. And, uh, you know, when, when I listened to the music, for, when, when I did listen to the music for the first time ma many years ago, I didn't think it was going to be this much work. But when I actually play it and uh, learn it, then I realized that what whatever he wrote is absolutely just, uh, it's not your typical, you know, classical music type of music that you can just learn on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> yeah, it's incredibly precise. Every, yeah. every detail is written. There's no room for, you know, rubato or anything like that. It's all written into the music, so you have to just play everything. It's, and take it's the, a lot. Take <laughs> the, which movement was that? The sixth movement, uh, I think, for, for instance, where he I, I just does not put measure numbers. Uh, I mean, time signature. Uh, time, time, time signature. signature yeah. He doesn't put time signature in the sixth movement, and it's, uh, you know, and we're all in unison for the whole movement, four pages of violin music, and fast, all kinds of, you know, uh, turns here and there, and uh, I, I think uh, there's only one piece that I can think of in my mind that's written like this, and it's this messy out piece. The instrumentation, again, is also, uh, it's not unique, but it's rare amongst uh, well-known composers. Hindemith actually wrote um, a piece for the same instrumentation, um, but that presents its own challenges. It isn't string quartet or woodwind quartet. It's, you know, you're mixing, uh, you're mixing and matching uh, three families of, of instruments, and I think that um, while it is precise, as Jing said, there aren't uh, measure numbers yet. There's very specific, uh, detailed, uh, rhythmic ensemble. You also have, in, in my case, in the clarinet, there's a third movement that's only a solo clarinet movement, which is probably a little bit more free. And then, of course, you have uh, duo movements and so forth. So you, you have you have examples of everyone all together, and then you have examples of solos, you have examples of duos and so on, and I think a lot of them uh, take on different uh, challenges and moods in their own right. If we were playing Schumann Quartet or um, Brahms Quintet, we, we have a certain expectation because we're all brought up with this tradition, and 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 we can just you know get together a couple of rehearsals, we can, can do a very good job of that, but this is... I mean, our role also changed a little bit. I think I, I, at least for me, when I play contemporary music, you feel like you're an ambassador of the music. You need to play it well so that people will want to hear it again. Um, you, you don't have that problem when you're doing Schumann and Brahms. We actually have to live up to the expectation. So there's a slight sort of psychological difference.